And good morning, welcome. It is February the 11th, 2019, and welcome to another Effective Virtual Conversations call. I'm Jennifer Britton, uh, the author of Effective Virtual Conversations and the host of these monthly virtual sessions. In today's busy world, I know how many people catch up on these after the fact, and that's why I'm committed to offering, continuing to offer monthly calls on topics related to virtual events, whether it's about virtual collaboration, virtual learning, creating more engaging calls. Thanks for joining me live or virtually. So we're going to jump into the topic of enhancing your virtual collaboration in today's session. And I'm pulling from a couple of different chapters from Effective Virtual Conversations and my other writing. Um, you will flip through and towards the 350 odd pages, you will find a couple of chapters around collaboration there. So I'm going to be talking today about the range of collaborative approaches, skills for collaboration, making it work, specifically around the producer facilitator role or the producer coach role, and questions to consider when approaching virtual collaboration. Over the years, I've had the chance to work with some amazing co-creators. And whether we've been co-leading programs or I've been the facilitator and they've been the producer, these are really virtual conversations that stick out. So I wanted to sort of dive in into yet another layer of what helps us avoid the death by conference call. And in Effective Virtual Conversations, I talk about the importance of creating more engaging conversation touch points. Now, depending on, well, it's not even whether you're new to this work or not, there's a lot that's going on as we facilitate engaging conversations. And having a partner to do this with can make a big difference. So what do we want to be keeping in mind? Well, in collaboration in general, there are several, uh, there's really a continuum here. We can be co-creating programs where it's jointly owned. You might be co-coaching, co-facilitating. Uh, we can also be collaborating where maybe we're brought in and we're bringing our own things and working with one other person who has our backs. We may also just be cooperating to make something happen. So as we move along the continuum from cooperation and coordination to collaboration co-creation, we're really upping the ante around things like risk. How much risk we need to uh, take, how much time it takes to actually do the work. Uh, we need deeper relationships when we're co-leading programs together than if I'm just coming in offering what I have to offer to an organization. And that can have some significant differences in terms of like our commitment to each other, the amount of preparation it takes, and also the accountability or the ownership and relationships I have with the people that I'm working with. So I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I think often we say collaboration is one thing, when in fact it's a whole continua. So I'd like you to think about how you might be collaborating together in a virtual event. The piece I haven't even touched on yet is the collaboration with your group members. And I think before going any further, I want to say what is critical is that we're always co-creating or co-creating to the best of our ability in the virtual space with our learners. If we don't, we go back, we see the death by conference call, where we're simply the blah, 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 on the other end of the phone. If we really truly want people to engage with us, to be focused, to not have multiple devices on the go at one time, uh, we really want to make sure that we are building trust and connection with them. So what is collaboration? Well, I'm pulling today from a couple of definitions. One is from Ken Blanchard, Ripley, Rariso, and Carew, uh, they had a great book out a few years ago called Collaboration Begins With You, Be a Silo Buster. And they write, collaboration is a whole order of magnitude beyond teams. It is the DNA of a company culture. For many years, I've been using a definition by um, Berlin and Berlin. I'm just gonna step aside for a minute, pick up a copy of Effective Virtual Conversations, and I just wanna make sure that I get it right. But in this chapter on virtual uh, collaboration, uh, you really will want to make sure that you are working together um, and working around shared norms. So pages 385, 384 is where you're going to find it. Berlin and Berlin is a definition that I've used for many, many years. In partnering, in collaboration, we want to make sure that we have shared experiences 
shared relationships with purpose. And we also want to make sure that we are working across differences. So in Effective Virtual Conversations here on page 385, you're going to find these eight skills. Trust, candor, connection, flexibility and adaptability, the ability to be self-aware, our ability to work across differences and build relationships. And all of these are required. We need to trust, trust not only our abilities, but trust the process and trust the people that we're working within. If we're not able to bring our true self to the conversation, very hard uh, to be trusted. And as we know, trust begets trust. So if I'm asking to really uh, work in partnership with someone, really key that we do that together. And I often share these eight skills as I work with HR professionals, with coaches, with trainers, with leaders. You'll notice here a little speech bubble saying group activity. And one of the things I like to get groups to do is to actually think about what are those things you're specifically doing around building trust? How are you inviting people on a line? How are you inviting them to stream, to introduce themselves, to set expectations and share what people can expect in your work together? It's these little things, but these things add up in a virtual space to create trust. And it's really the foundation, which is why I have it as number one. Now, another part of collaboration is candor. And you might be surprised to see that this is number two on the list. Um, relationships, collaboration is grounded in partnerships. We need to know what's working and what's not. And if we are too concerned about being seen a certain way, or we're too concerned with offending someone, we may actually weaken the relationship. If you are truly collaborating in that co-creation space where risk is high, relationships need to be deep, we do want to make sure that we are candid with our feedback. This great work also requires that we have very good connection, that we're working within the moment. And as we move through today's call, I'm going to be sharing some of the questions you might want to be asking. Now, it does require that we, are, we exhibit and we embrace flexibility and adaptability, which is sometimes easier said than done. As I said a few minutes ago, as we move across the spectrum to collaboration, it takes more time. It asks for more from us. If I'm really co-creating a program, I need to be ready to let things go, to co-design that in the moment with my partner. And that does require a level of self-awareness, what I'm good at, where I might get in my own way, where I'm going to get in other people's way, where my strengths become over magnified in times of stress and pressure. So we do want to really be aware of our biases, our strengths, our styles, our blind spots, and that will help us hopefully work across differences because part of being able to work across differences is knowing ourselves. As I was sharing last week in a series of uh, group and team events, our styles really show up in these times of pressure. And it is often when you're in front of a group where the group is from across the world, we have multiple languages at play, we might have technology working or not working, that times are stressful. And that's when we often lean into our strengths, almost to the point of over leaning in, over magnification. And so working across differences now means uh, understanding ourselves, understanding our over magnification, and knowing about what we need to change so that we can work more effectively with others. Part of strengths, part of styles is, is about us, but it's also about how do we adjust ourselves in working effectively with others. And that is truly grounded in relationship development. We want to use great relationship building skills, listening, feedback, communication, observation, give and take, and all of these different things. So in a virtual space, it's likely that we are going to be called on to collaborate in many different ways. And I thought it would be useful to pull actually from my latest book, Plan Do Track, um, which came out just a few months ago, where I get a little bit more into these five skills. And in terms of making strengths or making collaboration work, we do want to make sure that we're aware of our strengths, that we bring complementary skills to the table. And often people are, are intrigued by this one because it, you might think intuitively, well, shouldn't we be the same? When in fact, when you're working with groups, when you're working with teams, having that diverse vantage point, bringing diverse skill sets, bringing alternative perspectives to each other can be incredibly rich and valuable. 
I think of all the collaborative work I've done in the last 15 years of my career, and I've been very intentional with my partners in asking the teams and groups that we work with, what made this work for you? What did you enjoy about our co-facilitation? Often what we've been told is our complementarity. When I've worked with other people who are very different from me, gender-wise, physical-wise even, uh, skill-wise, that's often when we've been rated the highest. And I think it is because we truly can bring that sort of 360 view, that 360 perspective from um, just as if I'm showing up myself. So think about who you're working with and how are you complementary. Um, I'm going to go into some questions that you want to ask with any partners, whether it's a producer or whether it's just someone that you are co-delivering programs with. Obviously, when we are interdependent, like in a producer facilitator role for virtual events or maybe a co-facilitation, when both of you are running a program together, planning takes time. And it does mean that we're intentional, that we do some pre-planning, pre-meetings, um, it doesn't mean that we want to over plan, but it does mean that we want to have a plan. And in my writing, you'll probably recognize in the last decade, I've used a terminology called the accordion. And like the accordion, we want to make sure that we're able to expand things and contract things as the group process is going. That's easy. Well, it's not really that easy. It is actually an advanced skill for individuals. And now if you're doing partnering work, collaborative work in front of a group, we need to make sure that we're in the accordion together. Okay, if we're not, then our accordions are going to actually start to clash with one another, etc. Uh, last week, I was doing a separate call related to Coaching Business Builder and Plan Do Track. If you're interested in this topic, you may want to go over to my YouTube channel. Just Google me, Jennifer J. Britton, and you'll find the whole Plan Do Track Coaching Business Builder series of calls there's a lot of intersect here. Um, and why I'm offering this up is because I had a great graphic last week of the accordion and these two uh, figures who had dressed up with the accordion with horse heads. Okay, so a heads of a horse. Why I offer that up is because it really does, we wanna make sure that we are in sync, we are in rhythm, we are not in disconnect or contrast or conflict. Even with our complementary skills, we need to figure out how can it work. And that does take the planning, it does take intentionality, and it does take trust, right? I need to be able to lean into my partner, be able to trust him or her explicitly, and to know that they have my back. If I'm not sure of that, it will probably show up. It may be a more of a waiver. And while it could be a good program, it's probably not going to be a great program. And I think for so many of us, we really want to differentiate ourselves in the virtual space. I don't want to just have a good call. I want to have a wow call. And I want to be able to say with surety, this is going to be a great investment of your time because time is money in today's world. So what's different with virtual collaboration? A couple of things I think that's key as we embark on these journeys. Number one, out of sight does not equal out of mind. It's very easy to put things off. Oh yeah, I have that call tomorrow. Um, you know what, we need more preparation, really. That's one of the key premises to effective virtual conversations. We do need to be prepared. Everything can be and probably will be magnified, okay? So if you are not in step with each other, if you're not like these two partners that are moving together, it could be magnified that you're out of sync. And what happens when that happens is people lose trust, people lose connection people will start to multitask. They'll think, oh, this is just really juvenile. They don't have it. They don't know what they're doing. And they probably will disconnect and it's very hard to get them back. They may just simply disconnect and that's it. The other thing that's different is, of course, different contexts and priorities. So um, really key that we share with our partners, share with our learners as much as we can about the different contexts, the different priorities, when we virtually collaborate together, we want to make sure that we're both on the same page in terms of prioritization. If you are not, that's when the relationship gets weakened. And for any of you that are coaches, you'll recognize we often talk in coaching about the importance of partnership in terms of client-coach relationship like a triangle. And if both parties are leaning in together, it's a solid relationship. If one party is leaning in more than the other, it becomes unbalanced. And when things become unbalanced, they can break, they can fall, they can falter. And again, what's at stake with virtual collaboration is often the experience of not just the two of us, but the experience of a team, the experience of a set of learners, 
They may be engaging at all times of their day and night, taking time out of their busy schedules. So it's really key with virtual collaboration that we do put intentionality around this. And um, what's different is also showing up when things are not clear. I think, again, that magnification can happen. Um, and you often just you know, have a little window. What is said is in the screen. That's all people see of us. So it's really key that we are also inviting conversation feedback real time so that we can adjust the conversation as we go. Virtual collaboration, virtual facilitation is not something you want to just speak it and be done. You want to have multiple touch points for evaluation. And in past calls, you've probably heard me talk about use of emojis, using chat, uh, using annotation. You know, review is as important as input. And we do want to make sure that we're getting feedback in terms of what's working and what's not and being able to adjust. Now, if we're doing that then with one other person, let's have a plan. Let's be in sync, lockstep together. So going back to 2013, um, when I wrote From One to Many Best Practices for Team and Group Coaching, I shared sort of what I called in those days the arc of co-facilitation. And I shared with you many different strengths in terms of how we want to co-design facilitation experiences. As you'll notice here, there's four steps. We want to do some, uh, have some conversations before we get going. We want to have conversations, and that, that first set of conversations are really like, do we even want to work together? This is not even like during design. This is like, do we want to work together? What are our strengths? What's important to us? What business philosophies uh, are important to us? And, and is it really appropriate to work, right? Again, in an additive mindset, probably good if we're complementary. However, how do we connect? How do we see a, a connection and an added value to the people that we're working with? I really love the writing of Morton Henson in this area. He is the author of co facilitation sorry, he's the author of Collaboration and also the author of the recent book, uh, Great at Work. And I really enjoy his writing. He, he brings forward, even to Great at Work, this notion that he coined disciplined collaboration. And disciplined collaboration is knowing when you want to collaborate and when it really is not in service. HBR, uh, Harvard Business Review, had a recent article. Well, it's not recent now. It's maybe two or three years old. And they talk about, like, the fallacy of over-collaboration. Same thing, you know, when is it appropriate to collaborate? When is it not? We want to be thinking about that at the start and even during the design. As we go to co-design and we've realized, yes, this is a person that I want to design with, who's going to take a lead? Uh, what are those accordion points? What's our common stake? And, and how do we check in throughout the program? That's going to help us really be successful together in the actual moment. So we have a plan going in. During implementation, we want to know who's running with what, when, um, how's it going, have touch points with our group members, obviously, and have a really easy way to connect with each other so that we can make those adjustments on the fly. As it relates to co-facilitation, virtually, you know, if you can get face-to-face -face and, and lead from the same room, that can actually be really, really beneficial. It's not always feasible, but like those small signals that aren't seen on the camera can actually make a big difference in having everything go smoothly. And when you have high stakes virtual programming where you might have 25 or 30 people or 50 people or 200 people on the line, it's these small things that are seen and are viewed. So uh, one, of my, one of my favorite co-facilitators who's a producer, um, we were always able to do work side by side. We'd have our own devices running. We would let people know that. And so we would be seen as two separate entities, but behind the scenes, we'd be able to really like work together and make notations to each other so that our calls could really, really uh, go seamlessly. And they always did. Um, you know, it wasn't for our work on the back end, but it really was that partnership. So we do want to learn with every co-facilitation what worked well, what didn't work well, what were the successes, what were the failures, what are the lessons learned you want to carry forward individually and collectively. And that can help you set up for success next time you co-facilitate. So one of the um, part, one of the things that I think is key is like in our role with a facilitator, 
for a producer. I'm going to get into some of those key elements. A couple of questions I really want you to lean into are, what are our strengths? So to the design phase, as you're going to co-design together, really useful to understand who we are as individuals, what do we value, what do we bring to the table, what's at stake? If this goes well, what could happen? And alternatively, if this does not go well, what's at stake? That helps make it really crystal clear in terms of what is um, available and what the, the potential impact might be if it does not go well. You also want to talk about your expectations of each other. Like, are you going to be meeting regularly? Is there an expectation that you're going to be feeding forward? And, and like anything in a virtual space, make it more explicit. To this notion of strengths, I think it's really important that you get a clarity around how you can lean into each other. And I've been using this graphic for a, a few weeks now. I've really enjoyed it because I think the hand under the arm of the tree really says it all. We wanna use our strengths, we wanna use our systems, and they may be systems together. So systems could be things like registration, chat, um, annotation. These are all systems that are running in the background of our virtual facilitation environment. What are the things that are gonna support you? Is it instant messaging that you and your co-facilitator or producer are gonna work on together? You wanna think about your strengths and you also wanna think about what systems are gonna support the two of you in this work. Always, always think about how you're complementary. And again, I'll go back to the research which shows that partnerships that are usually complementary are stronger. They're not necessarily easier to create, but they often are stronger. Because again, one plus one can equal more than two if we bring varying skill bases. So you'll wanna think about how are we complementary? How are we different? What is the weave? What does this create? And what blind spots also exist? Now, blind spots, what I mean by that is what are the gaps? What are the things that aren't we bringing? Even with our skill sets, what is still missing that's needed for the groups that we're working with? I love this question and this graphic now that I found around what blind spots exist. Often we can't see the blind spot, right? Just like this car and the person in the mirror, it's in the blind spot, we can't see it. Hopefully we're asking the questions though so that we uh, can name it when we think about it. And this is also a question that we wanna be attuned to when we get evaluation feedback. What are the things that we haven't thought of? And that might be a question on your evaluation. It might be simply something along the lines of what comments do you have around our co-facilitation? You might have co-facilitation as a rating. Uh, you might have something around what are the suggestions you have for when we co-lead programs together. Again, as appropriate, there are gonna be different types of questions you can ask to different audiences. Ultimately in co-facilitation is what's important. Like what is important to me, what is important to you, and then collectively what is important to us. And there may be always this merge between the individual, the two of you, the collective together and how that intersects together. What's important takes us below the waterline. And I talk about this more in my most two recent publications, Coaching Business Builder, which is for coaches, and Plan Do Track, which is for virtual facilitators, entrepreneurs, etc. Same book, just different audiences, few different sections, but both books have the iceberg in it. And uh, this is something I think many of you will be familiar with. Again, in our work, especially as coaches, we're working not only around results, the results a team gets, the results individuals get, but we wanna help people unpack the layers and understand their behaviors. Underneath the waterline of results and behaviors, we have all these other things, mindsets, habits, perspectives, assumptions, beliefs, and values. And it's often these things under the waterline that get murky, that get, uh, they can be different. And so in a co-facilitation, we wanna make sure that we're clear on what are those things that are gonna help us really get alignment. We may bring different belief systems or different value systems, but how are we understanding how that's gonna to contribute to our different behaviors and perhaps potentially the different results that we get out of our work? We might even evolve our own sort of iceberg uh, for us collectively to this point of there's me, there's you, there's us, 
what is the collective around this, particularly our mindsets, our habits, our perspectives, assumptions, beliefs, and values. It might be a little bit different. So ultimately, feedback and follow-up is important, and you'll want to make sure that you're building that in. Do feel free to use some of those questions that I've, in, I've included there. And just so you know, this is also included in your book, uh, in Effective Virtual Conversations. It's in Chapter 12, Partnering Co-Facilitation and Creating a Culture of Effective Virtual Conversation. Because really, it is about the, the additive. It is about the collective. And one of the key roles that we might find is that we're working with a producer. I've spent a little bit of time talking about this already. You're going to want to look at questions like, what are your separate roles? Who's doing what and when? What are those areas that intersect? What are the things you want to do together? How do you want to do together? I talked about instant messaging or even notes if you're sitting side by side. What do you need from each other? What support? Uh, what signals do you have for each other? And I apologize for the typos here. And who's going to follow up on what? So working with a producer, really key. And you'll want to make sure that you uh, get to know each other. One quick way, and I shared this last month in the 2019 January Effective Virtual Conversations call, is you can use icons as a fun way. And this might be a good way to just do a quick introduction. Here's a little about me. Pick a few icons have them share a little bit about them, and then collectively, as you start co-designing together, who are you collectively? I like using this icons exercise as a quick welcome and warm up, getting people to circle or highlight what they're bringing to the call. This might be a really neat way to say, here's who I am, and this is my partner so-and-so, and this is who we are individually, but here's what we're bringing to you collectively. Isn't that a great way to just sort of note for people a different start to the call? Again, going back to where I started today, we want to shake things up. It's enough of the death by conference call. Really, we spend so much time in meetings. Isn't it worth making it a little bit different so people are engaged and really there, really working for the short time you have together? Now, always in my world, things continue to evolve. I talked a little bit about uh, my latest publications, Plan Do Track and Coaching Business Builder. Part of that is a current focus more on productivity, getting things done. And this really was inspired by talking so much about, you know, plan, um, death by conference call and making meetings more effective. So both resources are useful. And I've just launched the 19 Productivity Tips On Demand program. It's a new on-demand video-based course. If you are looking to amp up what you're getting done, this might be a useful program. You can check it out at teams365.teachable.com. That is, of course, my on-demand portal for leaders. If you're a coach, you might be very familiar with the Learning Lab and Design Studio. That's a live program and a live resource portal, on-demand portal for all things learning related. So that is, you can access it through learninglabanddesignstudio.com. Hope that you'll keep the conversations uh, going. And one of the things I've just launched is a conversation sparker zone. You can sign up instead of doing a Facebook group. I have a mighty network group and that is called the conversation sparker zone. You can join us at conversation hyphen sparker dot mn dot co. That's conversation hyphen sparker mn dot mn for mighty network dot co for company. And that's a portal which is uh, housed, I house it, Mighty Networks actually houses it, but uh, I administrate it and it's just for us talking about everything from virtual conversations to virtual remote teams, business building for coaches, plan to track, virtual professionals, and also uh, group and team coaching issues. So you can choose what you receive messaging around and what you sign up for. Well, with that, I want to thank you. Thank you for joining me for yet another call. If you enjoyed it, let us know. Last month's call looked at team culture. And really, ultimately, I hope you'll take these bullet points out of today's call. What's important? What's important for you, for your partner? Who are we together? Make sure that you're also building in time for check-in and feedback. And with that, just a reminder, in Effective Virtual Conversations, there's the tracker from the book. You can look at it. It's actually an Appendix B. It's the Action Plan Tracker. 
right here and you'll find it on page number 413. It's not right at the back. Take some notes as you've been listening to this call and any of the others, you can take some notes. We've been looking at chapter 12, partnering and virtual facilitation today. Hope that you might join us for uh, an upcoming call, Virtual Facilitation Essentials. It's going to be starting on March 1st on Fridays, 11.45 to 1 p.m. I've talked a little bit about the new on-demand programs. And of course, I've got annual programs running all year. Leadership Lab for Leaders, Learning Lab for Virtual Professionals that are involved in learning, and the Business Development Lab, which is known as the Coaching Biz Growth Lab. If you're on Instagram, final little plug, let's connect at Coaching Biz Builder and take advantage of the 90 Days Plan Do Track series that I host every day. So with that, thanks for joining me for another call. Do check out Effective Virtual Conversations tips at our blog and on Mondays. And with that, I'll see you next month. Take care. Our call in the month of March, just know it is not the second week of March. Please refer to Effective Virtual Conversations for the timing on that. I'll be away on holidays, second week of March, enjoying some sunshine and warmer weather. Winter's almost done. So with that, I'll look forward to getting back in the skies. Hope you have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye.